<laughs> oh, let, we had to because we needed records and ink and stuff out of there. So they didn't go to the bathroom, but we had to get in there. <laughs> so we're going to all mute. There is stuff in there I needed, Maggie. <laughs> Kim, mute yourself. I was careful mute. when I went in there. And I didn't. Make <laughs> okay, are we ready? Okay. Go for it. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Anna Lane, and I'm with the Glen County Office of Education, and I've got a few of my colleagues from DCUE um, on the team here. Vanessa Ortiz, who's our fearless leader of our, of our group. Um, we have Philip James on our team, as well as Simone Hobbs from uh, CK Price Middle School. She teaches there. And our newest member, we're thrilled to have Kyle Taylor from Hamilton Elementary, who is a special education teacher there. So I'm going to do my presentation on behalf of our group. So um, here we go. It is said that equality is everybody gets a pair of shoes, but equity means everyone, everybody gets shoes that fit. Team Ortiz took this metaphor and we spent many hours discussing, massaging, tweaking, and rethinking our problem of practice. We couldn't ignore the stink. Shutdowns due to COVID brought to light that some students were feeling the impact more than others, especially low-income students and language learners who were and are falling behind more than their peers. The data we had at hand or foot indicated that underserved students, both language learners and students with disabilities, were struggling academically compared to their peers. So our problem of practice fits, and this is it. The current inequities within school systems contribute to barriers to educational opportunities among diverse student communities within Glen County. We decided that moving forward, we will address our problem of practice by collecting more data using our self-created survey, by providing opportunities for teachers to address the inequities of these student populations. Our small but mighty team strives to provide actionable steps for educators. We predict that curriculum, literature, and teaching practices representing diverse student populations will reflect a more culturally responsive environment within the schools resulting in a more equitable education. But how? We realize that this is an overwhelming call to action. We realize that well-meaning professionals may be inadvertently contributing to these inequities. We know this may be messy. We also recognize that inequities are systemic, and this is a mountain to climb, considering that not everybody recognizes inequities or may not be ready for uncomfortable conversations. And we know we need support. We need support from administration, school boards, staff, and community members. And we realize that this might be challenging, especially in our rural areas. So we'll take baby steps. This will take time, perhaps, perhaps years, to affect systemic changes in our educational institutions. But as it turns out, we've already started this journey, though we didn't realize it until now, until reflecting upon what we've done this past year. All of the members of our team have facilitated and or participated in professional development this year that directly addresses our problem of practice. These sessions have great potential to directly affect students by directly affecting teachers. Our learning equity by action and design kickoff was attended by 60 Glen County educators who are committed to making the changes so that all kids have shoes that fit. The kickoff was a springboard to awareness, conversation, and obstacles surrounding equity in education. Teachers have had the opportunity to engage in a series of online modules addressing UDL. The conversations are continuing and we see action being taken. Those who participate in the equity by design modules had the opportunity to apply for a mini grant which addressed equity. Many teachers asked for and received books that reflect the students in their classrooms, illustrate global perspectives, and update core literature. 
If one school used funds to hire an artist to paint a mural, which reflects the diversity of the students on their campus. We're now putting one foot in front of the other. We're in the process of planning professional development opportunities for next year in order to support our problem of practice, including participation in the National Equity Project, teacher workshops addressing equitable grading, and the Global Book Bag Project, and the speaker series. So for now, we're running with it. We're forging ahead with supporting our problem of practice and looking forward to continuing this journey next year. because every student deserves shoes that fit. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Great job. So now we'll we'll open up for, you know, 10ish minutes of um, some questions for this group and and some discussion. Um, so who wants to ask anybody in the group a question? I do. Um, anyone? Uh, I just wanted to know how involved leadership was, admin, in the in the coming into. Did people come in to speak or no? In anything? How about everything? I just want to know what the involvement and the cohesiveness of educators, teachers, with their admin in moving this problem of practice forward. Um, I, I'll, I'll speak to some of it, but I certainly would like to lean on lean on my team because that's a really good question. And that was asked to as that was asked of us or um, came to light early on in our process. Um, and I think it was mentioned in the presentation that that we we will need the support of admin of you know one of the many stakeholders in this. And um, you know we're, we're just uh, we're just starting this, so. Um, we did provide this kind of equity series, um, for lack of a better term, and um, had so many people, including administrators, participate in that. Um, moving forward, however, we know that we will we'll be need to ha have, we'll have, need to have some one-on-one -on -one conversations um, individually with with administrators across the county. I think we're going to be focusing on one or two schools at this point, um, but but we're not there yet. We're just like I said, this is just the baby steps and. We're in the beginning process of this. So I don't know if anybody else on the team wants to add to that. Yeah, I was just gonna add, um, and I apologize if I sound a little sick here. My daughter was kind enough to share her cold, but um, we did have an administrator on our team um, that um, helped kind of guide that conversation on the administration side of it. <clears throat> and um, unfortunately she's doing her doctorate program, so she's not going to continue with us, but that kind of helped co our conversations about how do we move forward and have conversations with the rest of the administrators in our county and what, what do we do from here forward. I can add to that at my school going forward, um, I've, we've created a survey for all the students and we've worked really hard on it and um, I'm able to give it to all sixth, seventh and eighth grade English students. So we're gonna push that out in the fall and I'm very excited about that. So I have support from my admin. As an administrator <laughs> who is not in that group, <laughs> but did take part in it. And it's an amazing program to work with everyone. So thumbs up, way to go. I was curious, what were some of the early barriers or, or resistance that you experienced to um, broaching this initiative with your constituency, given the, the popular media, all the, all the political landmines of them? At this point, we've had zero pushback. But we will move forward regardless of what what comes and comes at us and we'll and we'll handle it head, head on i will say we were pleasantly surprised um, when we pushed out the the professional development that came from kendra and anna um, and we were thinking you know if we get 20 educators to participate we'll be happy but we were lucky to have 60 and a lot of those did include administrators and instructional coaches 
So we just kind of ran with it and didn't look back. Um, oh. Let me add about barriers, because we like that word barriers. And in the beginning, we had barriers like self-imposed. Um, we really took a while to develop our POP. And in the beginning, we were limited, limiting ourselves to um, language learners. And then we evolved. So we kind of grew in our, in our thinking. I'm wondering with that set that you did, like the um, online trainings, was that something that you had to purchase or was that something that's available? Um, how did you come across that? I've seen that book, but what are your online modules? So Katie Novak has, has hi Christian, has a, um, a set of online modules um, to purchase and uh, we had grant funds. So we were able to offer um, the modules really to any Glen County educator who um, wanted to, to take part in that. And then those that, that completed the modules were then able to apply for the mini grants, um, which were also grant funded. So we were lucky to have those funds. Anna, can you talk about the global book bags? Please. Oh, absolutely. So um, Kendra, who's on this, um, who's here with us also, um, we were able to provide a two day workshop for um, most of the teachers were in Glen County um, through the Global Education Network. And um, it provided, for K4 teachers, provided 25 books per teacher. And then they worked in collaboration with each other to create um, learning activities for each book. And the books were represent, uh, was a representation of, you know, families around the world, um, students with disabilities, um, uh, students with, with same-sex parents and whatnot. And um, the ideas are this, these book bags, one ba book per bag and learning activity per bag, go home with students, to, with their families and share those, the, um, that literature and have activities that go along with that. So we had oh, about 27 participants take place in that and they'll be pushing out um, that project next school year. We'll be touching base with them again in January to see how that, how that goes. And that was also grant funded. Um, Sarah also asked, was the professional development part of choices on the back to school days or at other times? We rolled them out um, at the beginning of the school year and um, they, it was just a voluntary sign up. After hours, after school hours. Yeah, that's impressive. You got so many people. We were thrilled. Hi, Sarah. Yeah. Go GCOE. <laughs> <laughs> We have time for one more last uh, question. When you say grant funded, are you talking about this grant or are you talking about another grant you were able to get? Yeah, I, I can't, uh, I just spend the money. I don't know where it came from, <laughs> but it was not from this grant. I know it was from, it was funds from another grant. But uh, uh, there's lots of other people on this call that can answer that <laughs> specifically. I just like to spend it. We had, I had a history grant um, that we spent some of it from, and then we had a Gleams Equity Math and Science grant. Yeah. So money that needed to be spent by year's end. And we thought, especially in the age of COVID and the excitement of being able to go on Zoom to do things, uh, that's how we were able to get so many teachers involved and be able to get uh, money directly to them. I would say my group of teachers that were part of it enjoyed it thoroughly and were act actually implementing it in the classroom. Uh, so they saw results. Great. Okay. Well, if you're not looking at the chat, you probably should because there's more shoe puns than I th <laughs> think uh, I ever knew were possible. <laughs> in there. Um, so um, 
thank you to this group. Amazing work um, and a beautiful presentation. Um, so uh, we appreciate you and appreciate you taking the time to share um, your learning with us. Um, and any last words you wanna say or, or Vanessa or anybody else as part of that team? No. I just know we're, we're looking forward to, um, to next year because we already have things um, scheduled and, and ready to go. So it's exciting. Mm -hmm. Very exciting, great job. And okay. if you're in Glen County, look out for that speaker series, my little plug in there. Yep. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, you guys. Uh, appreciate it. So jot down any ideas that you, you want to steal, anything you want to make sure you remember, and then we're going to transition to um, Dave McKay's group. All right. Thanks, Holly. Great job, GCOE. Um, our tone is a little bit different as uh, we're running with you all, but uh, we got some people in our community that have been trying to tie our shoelaces together before we get out the starting block. So um, Ignite is really targeted to people who understand uh, what we're trying to do, if that makes any sense. So All right, despite some efforts to the contrary over the years in Chico Unified School District, certain student populations, most notably linguistically and culturally diverse, as well as socioeconomically disadvantaged children, have consistently experienced disproportionately negative educational outcomes, lower graduation and achievement rates, as well as higher truancy and suspension rates. While some relatively isolated programs have come and gone over the years, CUSD has never developed a comprehensive, cascading, all-in strategic plan to address these equity gaps within our student populations. Why the relative inaction? Perhaps our consistently positive overall outcomes have contributed to a general sense of complacency. That sense of complacency could be why we've neglected to equip our staff with the knowledge, skills, and dispositions needed to proactively confront the persistently negative outcomes experienced by our more diverse student populations. In order to more clearly understand the myriad factors contributing to the problems facing our students, it makes sense to talk to our families to find out how we can more effectively serve them. Some students, excuse me, some leaders generated momentum to that end by reaching out to some of their parents and inviting them to informal conversations last summer, sometimes in their own backyards. Those early informal conversations led to regular meetings in which we set and achieved small yet significant goals related to creating a more welcoming, inclusive school climate. The Equity Alliance, as we subsequently named our groups, provides the opportunity for parents, community members, school staff, and students to collectively identify and remove barriers to success for all CUSD students, with a specific focus on student populations who have historically experienced disproportionately negative educational outcomes. NorCal ELC has stimulated our efforts to develop a grassroots movement in which our local community can work together to answer the hard questions that we believe lay at the heart of the problem. Some of these questions include, why do our socioeconomically disadvantaged students struggle disproportionately? And what can we do as a community to help these children get off to a better start in their adult lives? How can we work together to mitigate the potentially debilitating educational and emotional effects of being a homeless or foster youth? Why do our African American and Native American students have lower test scores and higher suspension rates than other student populations? What can we do as a community to more effectively empower and embrace these students and their families? As momentum around these questions begin to build, more parents and community members begin to be drawn to our schools to collaborate on how we can more effectively work together to serve our students. Many teachers and staff members were eager to be a part of these positive, solution-oriented conversations about helping all students achieve more. What are the common themes emerging from these conversations thus far? It seems to come down to being more intentional with our families, more intentional about how we welcome and provide space for community agencies working with students more intentional about how we recognize and represent the societal contributions and the authentic histories of diverse populations, more intentional about how we engage with one another as community members around some important yet likely uncomfortable conversations about how race and class may affect the student's experience at school, 
But what about the politically charged nature of these topics that has engulfed the media and created yet another divisive force in our country? How do we, as school leaders, navigate that terrain? Buzzwords and confusing jargon may be trendy to drop in social media posts, but they only serve as huge distractions to the daunting task at hand. Rather than allowing our community to be herded into a red corral or a blue corral based on emotional responses to seldomly understood theories, let's come together on common ground to identify and remove barriers to success for each student, to improve access for every child to our continuum of resources, supports, and services, to conquer challenges that have plagued our educational system for decades. Nobody in CUSD wants to reduce children to a physical trait as genetically insignificant as skin color. Nobody in CUSD wants to impose Marxist ideals on our students. Nobody in CUSD wants to endorse an ideology that holds as its central premise that America is steeped in unredeemable evil. The evidence is undeniable. Many of our student populations struggle year in and year out. The stories we elicit from our families illuminates that data and gives us insights into how we might improve our system. Many of us educators have witnessed student success stories in which the socio-educational prerequisites fell into place. Let's scaffold and build the next level of our local educational system together to ensure that those prerequisites for success are truly accessible to each and every student every day. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dave. Okay. All right. Questions, thoughts, comments. We'll take a, 10 minutes for this. So Dave, what role might a um, hiring a more diverse teaching staff and faculty at Chico Unified School District would play in moving that conversation forward? Great question, Al. Thank you. I uh, would defer to my team. If anybody wants to take that one on? I will. Well, so I, I, I think we all probably realize the importance of representation and, and a workforce that looks like um, our student population or reflects our student population. And right now we just don't have that. And so we have been speaking with our HR. Dave and I have talked with uh, Mr. Shepard. I've talked with Jim Hamlin, our, our, our superintendent, our assistant superintendent of HR and finding some ways that we can go out and, and really diversify our, 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 our teaching population. Actually, not just our teaching population, our whole staff population. So um, it, it plays a big role. And so we were hoping that we can take that step and move forward on you know, getting that done. Mike, I'd like to piggyback on that too. And one of the challenges we realized we were facing is not knowing why candidates that were coming right out of our backyard, right? Right out of Chico State weren't staying. So we needed to find that out. Yeah. And so we, we created a survey that went out to a couple of the, the 255 EDTE 255 classes at Chico State, which is basically the, the undergrad class to identify if, if people wanna become teachers. And then we also surveyed the elementary and secondary capstone courses um, at the end of the spring semester to find out why they're not staying. You know, it could be something that we can address and it might be something that we can't address, but we won't know um, unless we were able to um, identify that. So that was a, a, a research step that we needed to take. And we have the survey results for working with the Chico State professors because they are interested in, in trying to identify um, some reasons why candidates aren't coming to their programs. So that was, a, that was a huge step. And then one of the silver linings of the Zoom environment was being able to attend, um, I attended 11 hiring fairs, hiring um, workshops around on the West Coast to get a feel for not just what we thought we should be saying and doing, but what are other people saying and doing that are attracting people that we want. So those are two concrete concrete steps. Um, we don't have our hiring completed yet, but we're going to informally, you know, um, formatively assess some, some of that and see how it went. Thanks. So 
I have a question for you, John, with just um, hiring, because if you're hiring and the people doing the interview tend to be a certain race and Chico Unified, it's predominantly white. Um, in the um, upper admin, um, I don't know, just for years, I've heard that for um, a lot of people that I have known, I don't know the statistics of it. I just know the people who have been hired and who haven't over the years. And I know what those statistics look like. So diversifying in the um, management as well might be something that could happen all the way down to the classroom. Absolutely. It, it's, it's not, and it was said before, we're not just talking in the classroom, right? We're talking campus supervisors, um, people that kids relate to, because it doesn't have to be a certificated, certificated person. And this is, a, this is gonna be a challenge, you know, that's gonna take a lot of effort and it's gonna take time, but we needed to start first with some whys rather than, okay, what are we gonna do? So that's kind of where we are right now is, is the why. Um, knowing that we can take some steps towards what we're going to do. Um, that's, that's where we needed to start. Well, uh, this is Jennifer Spangler. Uh, Dave, that was awesome. I, my daughter went to Bidwell when and, and, with Dave as the principal, and it's an amazing, um, very, very diverse, you know, junior high in, um, in Chico, and so Dave knows what he's talking about, even though I know you're representing your whole group here um, in that presentation, but what I really loved about what you emphasized, and I think what John just mentioned is the whys, and the why being, well, maybe Chico wasn't so concerned about it because the scores were okay. So I'm really glad you put that out there, and I think it's just really also I'm proud of you for you know acknowledging that nothing has been not much has been done and so that's you know kind of embarrassing to bring out there but I think that's okay too because you know that's where we're at and it's fine to acknowledge it but what I really thought was also awesome is you're mentioning it being intentional and so I'm again proud of you all because making it intentional I think is really important you know it's it's not just about not you know, um, saying, um, you know, discriminatory things in class or, you know, choosing out of date literature, whatever. It's, it's about being intentional about making people of color feel like they're, you know, part of the Chico community. I'm wondering what's your PLC gonna do next? Well, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, we're, we're just getting started. You know, we've identified some mid range goals that are really gonna drive our work. Uh, definitely for this next school year, probably longer than that. One of them involves uh, developing a professional development plan that seeks to strengthen our staff and equip them, as we mentioned in the presentation, and it's similar to our uh, GCLE folks. Um, the development and the implementation of the equity alliances to continue to add that intentionality piece and reach out to our, our families. Um, and also taking a look at representation in the curriculum and how we can be more intentional in that regard. I'm not necessarily looking to take anything away. It's kind of like when you're trying to you know, eat better, you know, they said, just, just add vegetables, just add stuff. You'll get, you'll get filled up on that stuff and you won't have as much room for the taco truck. I'm still working on that one. Um, and then we're also looking at homework and um, grading practices. And that, that's been coming up really from teachers. Some of us have been thinking about that for a while, um, but in terms of, of actual um, issues in our system that we have a direct control over that have a huge impact on the equity gap. Um, it may, homework and grading practices may be the biggest one. So that's another one that we're looking to tackle um, in this year and in the years to come. Anybody on my team want to add to that? Well, we were also looking at barriers to the uh, AP and honors programs and looking at those for uh, representation in, into the AP and honors program. So um, just to add what Dave was saying. Uh, I'm not on the team, but I'm part of Chica Unified. And I think that complacency piece is so important that we've just gotten so used to this is the way things are. And I know staff in particular are, are anxious that, you know, if they're going to be forced into doing something they're not comfortable doing, being pushed out of their comfort zone. And I think going back to yesterday, it's like, we can't wait for everyone to be on board to implement something. 
So I do appreciate the work that Dave and Mike and John are doing uh, with this in Chico Unified. I think it's going to be an important piece, especially um, as we come back in August, as to how this is going to be presented to the staff and how we're going to be introducing it um, across the board. So again, thanks guys for putting that together. So we have one more minute. Um, any last questions? I'd love to hear one big from the team, your, your big aha or takeaway from these last few months and moving forward. I was hoping to find out what grade um, they start having math tracking in that district. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't actually um, in uh, elementary more. they're given their, uh, each student is, is uh, in their grade level math and you know we provide supports there in, in real time. When students get to junior high, every sixth grader takes math A um, and it, then every seventh grader takes math B unless they wanna accelerate and then they can take math B slash C, just two years of math for the price of one. And then students uh, in eighth grade take math C, or if they took the accelerated math the year before, they take integrated math one. And that's just the main stream way that, that uh, our math program works. Um, students can, this is very rare, but they can take math courses through our, our online school, Oak Ridge. And I did have one Brainiac this year kid. He went through four years of math and one. Legitimately, the dude's gonna probably take us to Pluto or something one day. Um, but uh, as far as tracking goes, unless a student fails a class and there's some extenuating circumstance, we don't, we don't tell them, hey, you got to take that class over again. We move them along to the next class and we try to continue to get them exposed to grade level content while providing um, services in, in real time to help them, whether that be co-teaching, push in, learning center, additional time, et cetera. Does that, does that answer your question, Erin? Um, um, it makes me want to ask you more questions, but I don't want to take up everybody's time. So if I may, I will love to direct text you here or message you so that, um, because I, I feel like that's a huge piece to the puzzle in my district is how we're going to um, convince people who are very satisfied with their spot on the privilege ladder um, to, to accept the fact that it, that's not appropriate. And at this point, we have two different math curriculums that we offer to teachers selected um, A's and B's. And anyway, pardon me for taking up so much time. Loved your presentation, thanks. So okay. I wanna say thank you to that group. We could keep talking, but um, I'm getting texts that we have to stay on time, you know, from, from, from Kevin. So, uh, so thank you so much. And again, we could keep talking about this. This won't be the end of these conversations either. You know, we're gonna keep this network going. Um, so thank you um, to that entire group that worked really, really hard um, and had some tough conversations together. So um, we're excited to see where this goes. So thank you. Okay, now we, we're going to start our last one um, with the Butte County group with Jennifer Spangler. Are you Hi. ready to go? I think so. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick intro. Uh, my name is Samantha Munifering. I'm with uh, Orville Union High School District. Our team is made up of Jennifer Sprangler from BCOE, uh, Nancy Meyer from Paradise Unified and uh, CSU Chico, uh, Marie Fox from Orville City Elementary, and Christiane Langford from Thermalito Elementary. So um, we are all artists, and artists kind of break the rules a little bit. So we have a video to show you that we made. Um, and then this is just a small chunk of our story, but we wanted to give you a little bit of insight into what we did this semester. Do we, can you guys see the black box? All right, I'm gonna press play and I hope you can hear my audio guys.
Our PLC on Art and Cell came together because I had been learning about it for the last few years, but only in a very general sense. I wanted to involve Butte County districts that were more rural and lower socioeconomically, which correlates to fewer offerings in arts education. As a researcher in the group, one of my favorite parts of what we did involved research and data collection. We surveyed administrators on their knowledge of the benefits of teaching visual arts in South. We were surprised to see that administrators, actually 70%, had some awareness of the benefits of using art and visual and visual art and cell. That leaves, unfortunately, 30% that have actually no awareness of the benefits of visual art and cell. So one of the things I did that I don't normally do uh, because of the SEL things that I had been learning this year was I had a lot of pre-work before the students started making. They were able to create this physically and emotionally safe working environment through the use of the code of conduct that they created. One interesting thing that happened during this project is a group of students who I thought were very close friends had a, a bit of a falling out. Uh, they found that they weren't really able to, even though they were very friendly with each other, they weren't able to really communicate what they needed with each other. And because of this, the group decided to split up. Uh, and this was a really great opportunity for me to be able to come in and model some SEL skills with them. And as a group, uh, I was able to kind of like mediate and talk them through what happened and why, why it happened. And in the end, both groups were much happier working um, separately. But on top of that, they also didn't have beef with each other. They weren't fighting on the side. They had resolved their issues and were able to move on and complete their project successfully. As students reflected on the project, I found that they were able to identify where they could have done better. So they were really thinking about how they talked with other people, how their relationships affected the overall outcome of their assignment. I think overall it was a really useful assignment in, in seeing just how art and SEL can really inform each other. I've been teaching 26 years. I was a regular classroom teacher for 17. And I know that the terms have all changed, but the number one thing kids need is connection. So when I became an art teacher nine years ago, I really felt like this was, the, this was the medium to connect and support children. I wanted to build some self-awareness so that when they came across something that was difficult, they would have some resources. I decided to use a book called I Can Do Hard Things. And I had the kids think about something that they were good at and, and put fingers up. So uh, one thing, okay. Think of another thing that you're good at. And when I saw that every kid had at least two or three fingers up, I said, okay, let's stop there. And now just hold on to how it feels to be good at something. And remember when you're trying something hard that you can do it. The art lesson I taught um, was about weaving and I worked with fourth and fifth grade students. Um, and weaving is really hard. And in the beginning, kids want to quit. And so I wanted to see if I could really change my focus, be more intentional to help them connect with the I can in them. And, um, and I think it worked. They were able to kind of dig a little deeper inside of them of what, and, and pull up what they could do and their successes to help them keep going. This school year was absolutely nuts. For the first time ever, I had an entire class of students that didn't choose art. They were not thrilled to be in art class. For our first assignment, they hardly even talked to each other. But when we hung the art on the wall, they were so interested in what their classmates had been creating. When I saw that, I knew we couldn't just look at the art. I had them find a piece on the wall that felt to them like the other artists faced similar challenges when creating their piece. 
then they had to find that artist and have a conversation. And the conversations were amazing. For the first time, they were really connecting. For their final project, I wanted them to pull on more of the collaboration that we started with that very first project. I asked the students to create a mosaic mural. Each student was assigned a square, but was reminded that they could talk to each other and they could work together. What happened after that was really cool small groups of students worked on making their squares flow smoothly from one to the next. If I hadn't watched them create the pieces during class, I honestly would have thought that one artist did many, many of the pieces. They were so cohesive. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Love it, love it. We love that that you broke the rules, right? Oh, yes. Okay. So let's open it up um, for some questions. What questions, comments? Um, I think everyone's in awe of how amazing the artwork is and what you've accomplished. So what are some questions that you have for this group? I have some questions. This is Norelia Caldera from Chico Unified. Um, I just wanted to know if you use specific curriculum to teach social emotional skills or specific skills because in, or um, was there specific curriculum or specific skills that you taught related to social emotional? Yeah, we so we didn't have a specific curriculum. What we were really looking at is the power of our visual arts class to embed the or to grow the SEL competencies in our students. So we really looked at the CASEL um, framework and, and went off that when deciding how to kind of address it in our individual classrooms. And um, I don't know, Marie, do you want to talk a little bit about curriculum? Sure. Um, well, I, I was an SEL teacher during our intense COVID year, which um, kind of helped us to get a better understanding of what, what it was exactly, what to do. Uh, and I have a curriculum at my school uh, that some of the SDL teachers use, but not all of us. <laughs> and um, so we use that kind of as a starting point. And then we all did um, a variety of workshops and individual learning. And um, Jennifer Spangler was really good at getting us resources um, to, to expand that. And then from there, we kind of took it into our own hands and tested it, tested it out on, um, projects and assignments yeah let, yeah let me one of what we were trying to do one thing we were trying to do was to use these four teachers and see how long it took for them and what it took for them to become competent in at the sel language and so you know based on marie's experience with sel curriculum but then also looking at resources and over about two months as a group really studied sel and it was just so easy I think from what I've to, to put it to, to bring it out in the curriculum that they were already doing because it's so inherent there's such a marriage already between art and SEL. Right. Part of it was just um, it was it was just seeing what we already did and, and labeling it yeah. or making sure that if we did something um, that was more supportive of students that we did it more regularly. We built it into our lessons. We, it was already there, um, whether we're looking at art and talking about how does that make you feel or, or wh what do you think the person in the art is feeling or there's so many places where it's already there. It was just a matter of being able to recognize it um, and specifically tune it into to kids. Yeah, that's a very, yeah, because they do have a really nice natural marriage. And so it's nice that you guys were intentional about labeling and just make, modeling that for students. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I'd also like to add to that, that um, connecting SEL back to, um, you know, the 2020 draft California arts frameworks and looking at the visual arts, you know, myself as an artist, um, I, I really wanted to um, study both documents, SEL with California uh, Department of Ed, in particular, the art content standards. And of course, one of the first things I went and looked for, well, are there SEL, um, you know, content standards? And so I really researched that heavily before uh, trying to write up my lesson plan for my classroom. And um, as an artist, creativity and, um, 
and, and showing one's work and getting feedback on one's work, I thought would be a really natural place to start with SEL. And in particular, looking at you know, um, self-awareness and um, self-management along with social awareness. So the project that I had my students do, uh, which was listen to a book um, by um, Kobe Yamada, What Would You Do With An Idea? We talked about um, it's scary to come up with a new idea, you know, but how important creative problem solving and creative um, problem identifying is, not just in the visual arts, but across the board in all professions. And so I'd just like to end with um, something specific from the California um, arts framework that I uh, found in chapter one on visions and goals. And sure enough, it, there is a little section in there on um, social emotional development through the arts disciplines. And it says how inherent, you know, um, creative practices are, social interactions are with um, the tenets of social emotional learning. And ultimately it says, um, which I thought was a beautiful quote, uh, by Otis De Bono uh, from the Otis Report of Creative Economy of Los Angeles region in the state of California. There is no doubt that creativity is the most important resource of all. Without creativity, there would be no progress and we would be forever repeating the same patterns. So I thought that was, that was my best takeaway. Again, the, the power of connecting the visual arts and, and SEL. I would add to uh, Sandra Azevedo uh, helped us a lot early on by providing um, SEL resources and, and invited us to her BCOE um, SEL PLC that she had, um, and that 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 really helped me a lot to to guide me and to show me that we are already doing these things in our classroom. We just don't have the or I specifically didn't have all the language to identify where I was doing it. And now that I know how powerful it is and how important it is, I can be more explicit about um, putting that into my lesson planning um, and helping the kids to connect better. So thank you to this group. Thanks to all the groups. Um, we have to head back to the main room, but I, I wanna say a theme I'm hearing is intentionality throughout the whole, um, all three of these. So. Great job. Thank you for presenting. Thank you for engaging in the work. We're going to head back to the main room now um, for our last round. Okay, thanks. Okay. Well, before I get started, I just want to thank everybody who's gone before us. Man, there's been a lot of hard work done this last cohort, so I have really enjoyed these presentations. So round three, uh, here we go. So we are presenting for Shasta Elementary and our project is strengthening tier two intervention. Shasta Elementary is the largest elementary school in Chico Unified. We have a large population of students who need targeted reading instruction to reach re grade level and decoding. The Learning Center this year consisted of one resource teacher, a part-time Title I teacher, and a few aides. They mainly provided pull-out tier three reading instruction using evidence-based programs and instructional practices. The tier two instructional practices are in an area of concern because students who do not perform low enough in reading but are still below grade level, excuse me, typically do not receive instructions they need. Uh, this is evidenced by the growth made by students uh, receiving tier three instruction on the BPST, uh, high frequency words and star assessments. Tier three groups on average make much more progress and reach grade level quicker compared to tier two students. The Learning Center does not have the capacity to serve all students who are below grade level, so strengthening tier two reading instruction is needed. Our goal is for more students to be at or near grade level in reading. We want to support teachers in integrating a regular utilizing evidence-based instructional strategies to teach reading in their classroom. With a structure in place, teachers can become more knowledgeable about reading interventions. They can improve their ability to identify student areas of need using district and program assessments and make instructions decisions based on data analysis. 
We have supported the implementation of these tier two interventions by purchasing an evidence-based program, the 95% group program that supports these goals and provides teachers with the tools and training they need to implement these strategies. The mild moderate SDC, our resource and our title one intervention programs have piloted this program for one year to show the efficiency. Some general education teachers have begun to employ the program through tutoring groups and they collect the data every six weeks and at the end of the trimester as well. So far, we have had great feedback from general educators and support and staff utilizing the program. Student engagement is reported as high. And all pieces of the program, that's the phonological awareness, the decoding and spelling, multi-syllabic decoding and spelling, and the comprehension piece all appear to be easy to utilize, engaging for students and educational for the teachers. For example, this year, one of our second grade general ed teachers One student in particular made a tremendous amount of growth this year in that tutoring group. He started this year at a 56 on the BPST, which is far below grade level, and ended the year at an 84, which is above grade level. He was also assessed above grade, above grade level on the star reading comprehension assessment as well. He became so confident and excited about reading that he checked out his books from the library and read a Dogman book every day for the end of the year. Growth like this should help us inspire to continue to implement across the school site. As stated earlier, this has been a great learning experience for teachers as well. Our Title I teacher started her role this year after teaching in the general education classroom for seven years. Although she has a background in special education as well, she stated that she learned more about teaching reading this year while using the program than she had in her entire teaching career. She wishes that she would have had something like this when she was trying to do small group reading instruction in her third grade classroom. If and when she returns to teaching in the general education classroom, she will implement many pieces of the 95% group program into her classroom instruction. As we work on further implementation for next year, we are aware of the possibility of overwhelming teachers. We hope that teachers see that this isn't just one more thing to do, but instead is the evidence-based practice that can re replace tier two intervention materials that require teachers to spend time finding and preparing. We have organized the materials for easy checkout, accessibility for all ability levels. And this year, our focus has been on grades one through three for two tier, for, excuse me, for tier two implementation. And as you can see from data, our first and second grade students made significant growth on the BPST. We plan to share this data with our staff. Next year, we will be adding more staff to our team, including additional reading specialist and Title I teacher. Our next steps include working with kindergarten to train them in the phonological awareness piece of the program and in early identification, and our fourth and fifth grade to train them in the multisyllabic decoding and the comprehension pieces. We have a long road ahead. It is a large task to create school-wide change in practices. Volunteerism is essential as we are going ongoing training and consulting with teachers. As with each systematic change, it will take time for full implementation, but with the use of data, we hope to get most teachers on board and see great improvement over our tier two interventions. Right. Thank you. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. So let's go ahead and open it up for um, for questions and, and any comments for Dallas. No, yeah, Dallas, just wanted to check about the ninety five percent. Just uh, what kind of um, training and um things like that that you guys did just to kind of get teachers on board and have everything as needed to implement those i can answer Sorry. that Alice. go for it yeah go ahead julia thank you um well our resource teacher um she went through the training gosh not last year but the year before um so she did a i think believe it was two or three day training so she was using pc of it in the resource program and when I came on as title one she kind of showed me stuff and I had to kind of do my own kind of research this year um, and then I trained the staff in the different pieces of the 95% group program but a lot of sites in our district are have purchased it this year and so there's going to be a training in August like a two-day professional development where they're actually going to come to us 
and train the Title I, myself, the other Title I teacher, the resource teacher, and um, our reading specialist. So I, I found a lot on their website and then you can also buy through there, there's like the phonics lesson library where they actually have videos of teachers teaching all the different parts. And I found that really helpful. Great, thank you. Some other thoughts, comments, questions? Julia, could you put that website in the chat so we could look at it if we wanted to? Yes, I can. Um, I'm having technical issues right now. My, I'm on my phone and my laptop right now. So um, if you'll just, what, once the next group presents, then I'll be able to, I'll add that in there. I can do that, Julia. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Courtney. There's also some comments about the, it was so, your data is so clear um, that it paints a pretty compelling picture. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I have to say, I was surprised myself. I had all the data in a Google Sheets. And then I was like, there's got to be a way. Google has to have a way that they make pretty charts. And there is a little mm -hmm. icon in the top of the Google Sheets where you click the charts and it'll create it for you. So it's good there's to know. Your <laughs> there's your tip, your Google tip. Yeah. <laughs> and those that are interested in the 95% group, the one that I would, the, the program that, the piece that we're using the most for the tier two intervention is called the phonics lesson library. Um, and it has, it's, it's the systematic phonics instruction. It starts with basic, then it goes to advanced, which is like a lot of the vowel teams and then multisyllabic. And that's what we showed a picture like they're in the little envelopes and it has um, explicit lessons. It has passages for the kids to read. Um, it's multi-sensory. So it has all those pieces within one booklet for each skill and, and sequence. So the teachers can literally grab it, take it back, and I have everything scanned into Google Drive so they can print it on their own from their computers too. So you mentioned that you didn't want teachers to feel overwhelmed, particularly um, next year coming out of COVID education. Um, why do you think that a topic like reading um, you know, and improving reading would be perceived as, as one more thing or overwhelming to, to staff? What, what is it about the culture of our system that, that seems to feed that idea? Um, I feel part of it is just this last year with implementing a new math and a reading curriculum that we don't necessarily want to, I mean, it's kind of one of those balance of, here's another curriculum that you can use. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want it to come off that way. Um, so that's where my hesitancy is more of all the changes that we've had within the district. And then we also, our district also just purchased Lexia. And so that's another, like, cause Lexia has those pieces too, but, um, the teachers haven't really had training in that. And I, it, there's just so many things that have come out. Um, that's more of my concern. I, I don't feel like the teachers are going to be like resistant to improving their practice. I think as a school site and a culture, they want to continue to improve, especially as our population is changing. Um, I think it, unfortunately, I think a lot of it comes down to time again of, it's like more time, one more thing. They don't have the, the time. Mm -hmm. I had um, that question of a couple of the groups of, in Chico Unified, um, if, because the teachers needed more time. So is there something going on we don't have it in our district, so I'm wondering if your district, and I see a lot of admins here from Chico Unified, um, teacher time to do these things, um, because it seems like a lot of teachers really want to improve. Great question, um, Dave McKay. So what would be the pushback against this? And from what you just said, it doesn't seem like there's a pushback other than how on earth do you fit it within a day? And if there's time for it, then you can, uh, put it in there and then it makes your day easier and then you have more. Mm -hmm. Some of the hesitancy was that it, it, they thought they had to learn it, but it really is so well scripted and so thorough that um, even I often jumped, I never taught at the elementary level and I had no idea how hard it was to teach reading until I was with the first grade reading group. It was terrifying, but um, I, it's a super easy program to just plug in. And I think once they started to realize that when we had teachers start using it for our tutoring groups this year, 
the feedback that we got was like, this is great. Yes, I can just grab something and go. Um, so I think that once they see it and have some experience with it, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel intimidating anymore. Does that make sense? And, and I would add on that, like, when Dallas talked about the Title I teacher learning, that was me that learned so much. Um, and I, I hope that, I know that, like, the district is talking about the letters training for our reading specialists. And I don't know if down the line that's going to be something for teachers, but everything that's in these programs are kind of aligned with that. So them seeing all those pieces of why it's important to still work on phonemic awareness and how why it's still important to do substitution and blending and segmenting as they're working on those vowel teams, that'll all kind of solidify hopefully future training too. But I, I don't, I would be great if we could get more PLC time and all of that, but I don't have the answer for that. So I can add one thing here. I know we do have a lot of PD built in. One, one thing that COVID has been able to do is, as people have mentioned, give us the funding to help provide a lot of professional development. And we've been able to, to come up with a really robust, um, for what we know at this time, professional development for things that our teachers will need. Also, we have a, a mechanism called the, the District Leadership Council, or DLC, in place. And those are representatives from each site including our, all of our elementary sites. And, you know, I really encourage that we all do that dialogue with those DLC members about how this is going to be in real time. And um, what is, it, you know, we don't know yet. We, we haven't walked, we haven't walked into those classrooms yet. And we want to be sure to be honest and support each other. And that, that uh, DLC member on your sites, on all of our sites is a conduit for that communication. So, um, you know, tap into those people as well as, as we're going through this coming back. All right, thanks to um, Dallas's group and all the good impact put and feedback and um, great job. So let's go ahead. We're gonna transition to our next group. Um, Megan, are you ready to go? Yes, I'm all ready. Okay. All right. All right. My biggest nervousness is about launching this. Nobody has messed that up. So I'm like, okay, really don't want to mess that part up. So here we go. It has been said that a story's most important function is to remind us that we are not alone in this world. It is generally well accepted that storytelling was integral to human evolution and the human experience. Prior to NorCal ELC, our group became the Alternative Education Equity Team in an attempt to provide equitable access within education for families that were unable to access distance learning during the pandemic. We quickly realized this connection was a much larger issue and only systems change would sustainably address the problem at hand. The core tenant of our work became practicing radical empathy to understand our problem of practice. According to author Isabella Wilkerson, radical empathy means putting in the work to educate oneself and to listen with a humble heart to understand another's experience from their perspective, not as we imagine we would feel. Radical empathy is not about you and what you think you would do in a situation you have never been in and perhaps never will be. It is the kindred connection from pl a place of deep knowing that opens your spirit to the pain of another as they perceive it. Imagine you were a single mother. Imagine your preteen has been suspended from school on 70 occasions and you have never sat down with their teacher or principal. If this were your experience, how could you trust the very system of education designed to help you? The families and students of Butte County are currently disconnected from the educational and social service institutions which are funded to serve them. We believe that there is systemic mistrust between families and local support services. We seek to understand the cause or causes of mistrust by establishing authentic relationships with families. We do this in a as an effort to reduce negative outcomes for students, including chronic absenteeism, suspension, and expulsion. We seek to critically examine and understand anything that is pushing our families away from their community, be that intergenerational subjugation by public systems, suspension, expulsion, transportation, technology, basic need acquisition, and psychological needs. 
Specifically, we believe connection to school and attending school is invaluable to the health of a society. According to a large body of research, chronic absenteeism takes a toll on almost all aspects of student success and well-being. A student can fall significantly behind in their classwork after missing just a single week of school. In 2017 to 2018, the chronic absenteeism rate of students in Orville, California was 26% compared to a statewide average of 11%. This should concern us all. We suspect that rate has increased since the catastrophic fires and the pandemic. Among the 98 districts in California with chronic absenteeism rates above 20%, which the CDE classifies as very high, 84 were in rural areas. Punitive practices, which many schools are beginning to address, finally do not improve attendance. What does improve attendance is partnering with students and families to identify and address the root causes that lead to students missing school in the first place. Whether absences are connected to barriers that prevent students from showing up to school, negative experiences in school, or a lack of engagement, we seek instead to foster belonging while exploring the root cause. We have a strong instinct to belong to small groups defined by clear purpose and understanding, tribes. This tribal connection has been largely lost in modern society, but regaining it may be the key to our psychological survival and to decreasing long sustained inequity and system subjugation. A sense of solidarity is at the core of what it means to be human. We hypothesize that through a listening campaign, parents will reveal that there is a lack of trust between themselves and the school system and that they lack connection and belonging. Our hypothesis is that through the very act of asking and validating the experience of our families, we will increase solidarity and social capital. Social capital is defined as a set of shared values that allow individuals to work together in a group or tribe to effectively achieve a common purpose and in turn increase trust. The glue of society is trust. Its presence cements relationships by allowing people to live and work together feel safe and belong to a group. Trust in a leader allows organizations and communities to flourish while the absence of trust can cause fragmentation, conflict, and even war. We seek to build trust and belonging one story at a time. Bruce Perry insists that there is a physiology of belonging and when we have a sense of belonging, our bodies seem to quiet and even our organs function better. He also reports that of all the interventions he has implemented, the simple fact remains that the children who fare best are those with the most stability at home. This is why our team has chosen to start with the parents of our students. What story is more important than the story of a parent, the primary caregiver of the children we seek to help educate and protect? Relationships matter. The currency for systemic trust change is trust and trust comes through forming healthy working relationships. People, not programs, change people. Now imagine that same mother from before telling her story, not within a juvenile courtroom, but within a small group of adults with whom she has fostered both relationship and trust. The same image may now elicit a different feeling, maybe one of hope for how our systems can work for families. Okay, great job. Thank you, Megan. All right. Questions? Getting a lot of things in the comments. <laughs> what do, you know what? Can you start us off with your aha of engaging in this over the last several months? What, what's your, your, your big takeaway or aha that you're coming out of this year with? Um, and I would love my team to join as well. We are so um, like-minded and we've had such a, an amazing time working together. Um, I think the biggest thing that we're taking away from, I think NorCal, NorCal ELC really pushed the work forward. We were a team before NorCal ELC actually. Um, and our, our focus was really just to provide an option for, um, for students who were not accessing distance learning who didn't have the technology and what was that about mm -hmm. and then I think the real thing that we discovered through all the learning and the reading that we did was just the real inequities and the societal 
um, issues. One of the books we've been reading that focuses a lot of tr on trust and education and um, inequitable societies is called The Spirit Level. Um, and for me, that has been my biggest takeaway is just that this system's change is, is so necessary and it's not going anywhere. You know, you can give a kid a Chromebook, but that's not solving these types of problems. And um, my team can jump in whenever they'd like. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Um, I would say, you know, some of uh, the team members, including me, one of the big ahas of it was <clears throat> we were developing hypotheses around what we need to do and why and researching what others have done and why and it all came back to we need to ask we need to we need to talk to parents and we need to listen on, on what they actually need we can throw out a million different ideas and and really not hit the nail on the head with one of them until we ask and we dive into what people actually need and then we can provide. I have a question. Um, the first one you had said, Megan, about um, working with others, other service providers, that's been my question for 25 years. So, and you guys are a county, right? You can, you, you can have as a bad team. So you guys are a great resource for a lot of us, but how can we work with us? It seems like I have gone to so many things by different service providers and nonprofits, and everyone's trying to do the same thing and has their own office and all this money is going into, but we're trying to service the same kiddos. So I'm just wondering why is there something a little more cohesive? What did you find? Um, so part of our, it, I, I hear what you're saying and it is so incredibly frustrating for us as well, because even as a county office, you assume that we have connections and outlets to all of the service providers. We really don't. There's actually a lot of confidentiality and red tape around things like that. Um, and so part of our big vision of this, like of what we wanna build is a network um, of service providers um, that are in contact with one another about like kiddos, you know, we're not working in silos. Um, have we accomplished that? Certainly not. I think that the pandemic has actually given us great opportunity and opened a lot of doors to be able to communicate better. Um, I think that it, it made it clear that, that service providers, especially with mental health need, um, needed to um, be communicating better. But the big piece that I think is missing um, from the school system is um, connection to health. And we've done a lot of research and reading about that. Um, and that's talk about a, a dysfunctional system. It's, it's an extremely hard um, system to connect with, but that's really what families need. So have we found anything? No, really. It's really just part of our plan to, to create that kind of network. And just to tie just with what you ended with, have you... And I know there's a lot of red tape which drives us all nuts because it, I would help a lot, but anyone willing to provide services closer on next to schools, then they're really close and families don't have to travel, they don't miss phone calls, they don't need to get you know transportation, all of that. So so um I don't think Dina Capsalis is on the call today, but many people know about her. She works in paradise, she's she's brilliant. Um, one of the things that she said um, during something, a training or something that totally resonated with me was that in rural communities, um, it's not about bringing people to the service, it's about bringing the service to the people, and that's what's necessary in uh, rural America, um, for sure, and especially the county and, and all the counties working on this project. Um, so... There are some agencies that are willing to come to schools. Like if a child is at school, sure. Um, what we would like to see on our team is that services are willing to go to homes and um, actually, again, take the service to people. And we have accomplished more. We're working with um, Care Solace since the pandemic. Again, doors have opened, but it's we're not where we need to be in terms of getting services to people, no. Thank you. Um, we have time, we have like one more minute before I have to move us on. Any burning questions 
or comments? I have a comment. Um, and just because I saw one of the families that I had been working with up in Concow to rebuild their home. And I really appreciate the presenters talking about family relationships because as a case manager, there's no resources or funding to help these people rebuild their houses. And they're beyond you know, the ability to be able to conceptualize what to do with their children's education. They're just trying to survive right now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and they're getting triggered by the fires and the fire season coming up. So, so really trying to you know, ask them to do anything to help their family beyond just the basic needs is really ridiculous. And we do need to be going over above and beyond to reaching out to them and helping them. So I just, and it's all about relationships right now. It's all about relationships. The power of sharing those stories. So thank you. Thanks to that entire group. Again, another group that's worked really hard and had tough conversations.